Hello and welcome to our very first edition of our digital discussions. Hello and welcome to our third iteration of the eEstonia Digital Discussions. Uh, my name is Florian Marcus. I'm your Digital Transformation Advisor and moderator for today. Uh, this is organized by the eEstonia Briefing Center in cooperation with Royal Experience. And today we will talk about how to keep cyberspace secure. Now, before we get into all the nitty gritty details, we need to talk about some organizational things. First of all, even if you will make it halfway through the session and then you have to leave or you will only join in halfway through or you can't make it all together, uh, you can always check this out later. We will send to all registered users uh, the, um, well, the, the upload afterwards as well so you can watch the digital discussions whenever you have the time and feel like thinking about cyberspace a tiny bit more. Um, another organizational bit is the works up uh, environment that we use today. Uh, first of all, you can use it to uh, fill out your own pro profile. Uh, when you scroll over there, you will see uh, the profile button and then you can enter your name. Uh, you can tell us more about what kind of work you do and what field you work and also, of course, uh, the organization that you represent today. And this way you can get in touch with other people uh, that work in the same sector and with whom you might want to cooperate in the future. Uh, the second thing is that you can also click on the Q&A button. Uh, at the Q&A button, you can submit your own thoughts and questions about every single presentation done by every single speaker today and we will uh, deal with those questions afterwards in the Q&A session after every single presentation. You can also upvote other people's questions too. Last but not least, uh, before almost every single presentation we have a poll uh, where we ask the opinion of you, the audience, where you can answer uh, how you feel about certain uh, topics pertaining to the area of cybersecurity and cyberspace. Now, um, first of all, I want to tell you about the briefing center itself, though, uh, because we are organizing this, after all, in cooperation with the Royal Experience. So we offer all kinds of uh, digital services to people from around the world. We explain how digitalization has worked out in Estonia over the last uh, 25 to 30 years. And we will also help you get in touch with uh, Estonian companies that have helped us get this far, get to where we are today, uh, so that your countries can digitalize in the same way. We've got different kinds of programs, uh, even, even programs that last up to several days, uh, where you get a real deep dive impression of uh, what we've done in Estonia and how you can make it happen in your country also. But before we move to the first presentation, we want to hit you with the very first poll question as well that you can answer uh, in the WorkSup environment. The first question is, would you trust your government with your digital data? Uh, is the quick answer no way? Uh, for basic data, sure. Uh, yes, the government has proven to be trustworthy or they can have whatever they want, just like Google and Facebook do already today. So you can take a couple of minutes uh, during the next presentation, of course, watch the presentation, but also think about how you feel about the government treating your data. But without any further ado, I would like to introduce our very first speaker to you. Uh, her name is Annette Numa. She is my colleague. She is also a digital transformation advisor at the eEstonia Briefing Center. And she will tell you about how Estonia works and what kind of work Estonia does uh, for a safer global cyberspace. Let's take a look. Estonia is one of the most widely acclaimed digital societies in the world, and in terms of digital public services, it is ranked number one in the European Union. Cybersecurity touches on every aspect of society in Estonia, from elections to healthcare, from education to the tax system, and from banking to signing documents. 
How can we make sure that people feel safe in a digital society? How can we ensure the privacy needed for a democratic society to function the way it is meant to? In general, cybersecurity is guided by three concepts. Confidentiality, which ensures that users can be securely identified and that only those who have right to access the data can do so. Integrity, which ensures that data and information systems cannot be changed or manipulated by anyone unauthorized to do so. And availability, which ensures that data and information systems can be used when needed. In Estonia, there is another important component to cybersecurity, trust. Trust is established with transparency. The source codes for Estonia's public e-services are open, and they are secured and developed in cooperation with the private and academic sectors. Citizens can also check who has accessed their data. From our own experience, effective cybersecurity requires technological and legislative preparedness, cooperation with citizens and the private sector, and international coordination. As a small state and highly digitalized country, Estonia does not have a luxury of ignoring or underestimating what's happening in a cyberspace. We know that cyber attacks are becoming more and more stronger weapons of stealing money, influencing our democratic system, and of course also bringing so much confusion to our entire society. In a country where 99% of services are working and are accessible fully online, we cannot afford to have mistakes in our cyberspace. And cybersecurity has to be integrated to all life cycles of communication. But how does Estonia prepare for different attacks? And yes, you can prepare for different attacks. And what's the infrastructure behind there? This is exactly what we are going to discuss here today with me. My name is Annette Numa, and I'm working as a Digital Transformation Advisor at the Estonia Briefing Center. So to get it started, first we have to have a look of how our entire infrastructure has been built and how this supports our entire infrastructure and security aspects here. From the security perspective, Estonian information security relies on a three pillars. First of all, data confidentiality. Secondly, data availability. And last, integrity. All of these three pillars are very, very essential and very important. And if you think there that you can take any of these pillars away, it can drastically influence your entire security society. So I wouldn't really recommend to do that way. But starting with the first one, first of all, confidentiality part. Estonia provides its citizens a chance to identify themselves by using the electronic ID card solution. But that's not the only solution that we provide. There is also a mobile ID solution, smart ID solution, and also e-residency solution. All of these solutions are coming with a very secure pin codes, and every of your move will be encrypted and timestamped, and is also trackable later. Moving on to the second one, availability. As we know, in order to securely exchange data between different agencies, and of course also different private institutions, the x serves the basis of secure data exchange platform that makes uh, public and private databases to have 100% reliable information every time of the day. And last but not least, the integrity side, which remains very, very important as well. So the integrity is essential to maintain the trustworthiness of data um, that we see, and, and of course also to avoid all the kind of illegal loss and duplication and manipulation with data. So that means that nobody, not even hackers or uh, different kind of system administrators, and not even the government, they can't manipulate with data and get away with this. This is what, why we use the key SI uh, blockchain for. But with these uh, three pillars in place, we are offering our, our secure digital services that serve 100% interests of our entire nation. And to move on here, I already brought it out, the XROAD system. 
Now, when we think about the very large number of different data exchanges between different government servers, we have to make sure that this is 100% efficient and, of course, also the safety has to be always provided. In Estonia, we are using a solution called Ixte since the year of 2001. It's an open source data exchange layer that is fully decentralized and also distributed. You might want to ask, why can't you store information just in one single cloud or database? I'm going to tell you why. Because that's not secure or stable. We think that when we, when we actually uh, try to also uh, decentralize information, then this, every time that these different government agencies or institutions are exchanging our information, it's fully timestamped and encrypted. And that makes the data exchange much more secure. Also, the Xroad interconnects the public and private databases which are held in a distributed manner. And the access to information is very, very limited. So that means that unauthorized organizations can't get access to our information. And they have to sign mutual agreements from both of the sites. And of course, also from both of the institution sides, there is a security layer always in place that makes sure that this uh, agreement is 100% always also valid. But as you can see by the numbers, last year, Estonia had 1.4 billion transactions between different agencies. If you think about this number, 1.4 billion. Estonian population is 1.3 million. So you can just imagine how many transactions per one person this XO is able to do. And 97% of the cases, these transactions are fully optimized. So besides the security aspect, this is also a very efficient and, and fast system. And we are not the only ones who are using this system. There are a couple of other countries that also have already exported the same technology to bring out some. Finland, Iceland, Fur Island, Ukraine and Namibia. But of course, we are currently testing it out and piloting this in many other countries. And maybe you are going to be the next one. And now to also talk about uh, with, uh, with, with also um, the entire just like the competence side here. With a solid investment to our cybersecurity infrastructure, Estonia has developed extensive expertise in this area. And we are becoming one of the strongest and most recognized and valued international cybersecurity experts. Have you heard that the usual data breach, uh, discovering this data breach, would take around seven months in a word. Do you want to know how fast that happens in Estonia? Thanks to our KSI blockchain technology, we can discover these things instantly. And in the year of 2007, I guess many of you have already heard, we were facing the first a very large and, and so far the largest cyber attack. But that, that was, of course, also a wonderful lesson for every one of us here. And since Estonia is a small country, as I brought it out in the very beginning, it is extremely important to distribute this risk concerning the data. There could be cases of emergency of leak of data. We need to have a backup plan for, for that kind of cases. And our backup plan is called Data Embassy. Our first Data Embassy, where we have backed up our information outside of our territory, our own territory, is based in Luxembourg. You might ask, why? Why Luxembourg? There are many reasons for that. First of all, Luxembourg has a very great infrastructure. They have a great competence. They have been Estonian very big friends and partners since the early days. And of course, they're politically very stable place where we could have this, this data embassy. And now, just talk about the cyber governance side. Besides a very great infrastructure, a state needs to have clear understanding of responsibilities and distribution of these responsibilities. To be clear, to understand which government institution is responsible for which exact action. To cover some. The Estonian Information System Authority is home for our CERT EE department. And a department who is responsible also for monitoring all the network and solving cyber crimes incidents, coordinating also the safe implementation of IT infrastructure. And most importantly, they are also responsible for raising the awareness of cybersecurity. But that's also just one institution where we also have to report our incidents. 
and Estonian telecommunication providers and also our critical infrastructure providers are always required to report about cases and this is happening by the law. But luckily we see more and more companies, private companies, also informing and reporting about these cyber crimes because they want to help others and get some support from the state point of view for, for these kind of cases. We also have the Police and Border Guard Board. Uh, there is a cybercrime unit who also works in cooperation with many international partners to detect and of course also investigate the cyber incidents that have some way affected our citizens. If you think about the war, I think this is very clear um, that wars these days are happening much more often on cyberspace than on crowns. So I, w I would say that our, um, I brought our armed forces are never able to protect us in cyberspace. That's why we needed to also have cyber forces. Uh, we have Cyber Defense League, which involves professionals, uh, volunteers in national cybersecurity, and also Cyber Command, which supports cyber competence in the defense structure and is also officially a part of Estonian Defense Forces. Things might be great and internally, but one thing is sure that cyber attacks know no borders. So we are more and more dependent on international space, cyberspace. If our aim is to make sure that our cyberspace is safe, secure, stable, then cybercrime should have a similar consequences than any other crime. Therefore, I think it's very essential to have the clear understanding how international law applies in cyberspace. Surprisingly, Today, there is no clear or concrete agreement which laws apply in a case of cyber attack. Should there be consequences such as sanctions, travel bans, or something else? I think we should figure it out all together. Estonia already created Tallinn Manual, which was created between the year of 2009 and 2004. And Tallinn Manual was created by the invitation of NATO CCDCOE Center. The Tallinn Manual 2.0, which was created now in 2017, is the most uh, exhaustive uh, analysis of how existing international law applies in our cyberspace. Therefore, Estonia now also as being a non permanent member of United Nations Security Council since the year 2020, has also suggested to create this common framework where we would have the concrete consequences, what would be the steps following. And Estonia is also home for two very important organizations that deal with cybersecurity. And these are NATO, CCD, COE, and also European Union, ID agency. We will continuously also organize different conferences, cyber exercises on a global level, and different hackathons to get more people involved in the sector. And of course, create some new ideas that can also be helpful for us for making our cyberspace more secure. And now to sum it up my presentation, the lessons we have learned in our cyberspace. First, cybersecurity always needs attention. You can never stop investing to cybersecurity because hackers otherwise are going to be one step ahead of you. So we will recommend to everyone to keep investing and making sure that this is one of our biggest focuses. And also security starts from the lowest level. So that's why all of you are responsible uh, for making sure that our cyberspace is safe, not just the ministries, but all of you. So we have been organizing very successful campaigns to raise awareness. Um, and, and of course, also even campaigns on TV so to make sure that all of our citizens are aware of the risk. And of course, one thing is also very important. Transparency works. Your citizens need to understand and trust you. And last note that I want all of you to remember is that all of this success story in a cyberspace have been possible because we have been working very closely together with our private ICT companies. There are more than 100 companies who invest their time, money and effort to our cyberspace. And today, you're going to be lucky enough to hear three presentations from these companies. So I hope you're going to enjoy. Uh, the rest of the conference here, and I wish you a very pleasant day. 
Well, uh, Annette, thank you so much for your overview, and I think you, you touched on many important points. Um, we got uh, several questions from you, the audience, as well. Uh, and just a kind reminder, uh, we still have the poll one running, so if you want to share your own opinion with us, please do so. The first question from the audience is, what makes Estonian cybersecurity infrastructure special in comparison to other countries? Um, as I also mentioned in my in my presentation side, so definitely uh, our infrastructure by basing it on three pillars, because um, because we have been thinking through every single step, starting with the uh, citizens point of view. Um, that they have to be able to identify themselves in a secure way and then moving on to data exchange platforms and then also using different technologies to make sure that our data has been stored very, very securely. So we're not just relying on one thing, it's, exactly. it's a whole ecosystem approach, absolutely. Um, the second question is, uh, what can each of us do to improve and strengthen cybersecurity, in your opinion? Um, again, it's everyone's responsibility. Um, to be more aware th of the risks. This is the first, uh, first thing that we need to know. There are many, many exercises, and also one of our companies who are going to be talking here today, Cybexer, they are or also organizing different kind of exercises for, uh, for companies, for students, and so on. Mm -hmm. So we have to take that serious, because this is um, the risk that we're facing every single day when you're receiving emails or logging into your systems. We have to be aware of, of what kind of risks we might be facing. So I think um, that's where the focus should go. Um, absolutely. Uh, also, yeah, you touched on the on the issue of, of cyber hygiene. If we teach our kids regular hygiene, why not teach them cyber hygiene as well? Uh, the last question is uh, getting a bit more technical. Um, would it not be better to use a private cloud uh, considering data redundancies? Uh, I wouldn't agree on that because I'm a true believer of, of uh, decentralization. Because uh, when we think about also in a, in a point of view of citizens, that this is much more also uh, has more customer like uh, experience that side there or just like serves this kind of friendly customer experience to the citizens so that um, they, would, they would know where they would have to also uh, store their information or submit their information. And, and, and especially if this is decentralized, then it, it really much also uh, tries to avoid this kind of risk of, of including all the information just in one single point. So um, I, I think Estonia has chosen a very uh, good way to go there. Absolutely. Well, Annette, uh, thank you so much for your time. And before we are heading over to the next uh, presenter, one more reminder, uh, poll one is still open. Uh, and please also for the next presenter, keep the questions coming. Uh, it really livens up the discussion even more. Uh, so who is our next speaker? Well, it is Raul Rick, who is the National Cybersecurity Policy Director from the Estonian Ministry of Economic Affairs and Communications. And he will tell you about the Estonian lessons learned over the past few years. Let's take a look. Uh, hello, everyone. It is my pleasure to be here and talk about national cybersecurity and um, more specifically about the new challenges that we face in the cybersecurity field. So when we talk about uh, national cybersecurity, we have to uh, realize that national cyberspace, the asset that we actually protect, uh, is a complex organism with uh, countless uh, connections, interactions, and interdependencies of different information uh, systems. So these days, I would say that it's not sufficient anymore to protect the uh, different information and systems separately, but we need more holistic approach. And uh, according to the Estonian experience, we have had this holistic approach about uh, 20 years now. And uh, we have developed several uh, protective measures how to secure the whole uh, cyber uh, organism. The most important uh, protective measures that we have are two. Uh, one is XROOT that you already heard uh, uh, through the Annette's presentation. It's a universal system how we protect uh, our internet connectivity. So uh, we basically create a security layer on top of the internet so we can uh, connect different entities, different actors to the same information exchange system. So the private sector, public sector and also the citizens. 
And the second very, very important uh, cornerstone system is our uh, electronic identification system. So basically, through that, we can provide safe authentication and legally valid uh, digital signatures. So these are the cornerstones of our national uh, cyber organism and uh, also the national cyber security. But if I put the same systems to the coronavirus context, uh, I can say that uh, these systems are like a masks and vaccine for our digital organism. So without these, we can not really protect our cyber body. Um, regarding COVID-19, uh, I've been repeatedly asked recently whether coronavirus has affected uh, the functioning of our society. And I have to admit that uh, actually not too much. Uh, Estonia, Estonia took the digital path about uh, 20 years ago and um, it has paid off. So we used the digital systems before coronavirus and uh, most certainly uh, we can benefit the electronic services during the uh, COVID-19 crisis. So uh, the crisis has not actually affected our administrative processes. Um, but of course, it doesn't mean that uh, we don't have challenges at all. And uh, I have to say, we actually like challenges. It makes life more interesting. And all people who are interested in challenges are very welcome to the cybersecurity field. Um, the first big challenge that we face is actually related to the reliability of technology. Um, the question is that how can we make sure that all these sophisticated systems, uh, hardware and software, uh, communication systems, ICT systems, etc., etc., doesn't have or don't have vulnerabilities and backdoors. The basic problem here is that uh, nobody has these days 100% capacity to uh, conduct technical inspections. So we cannot go through all hardware and software and ensure that uh, these don't have any vulnerabilities. Um, just to give an example, that uh, if we take a Windows operating system, it has about um, 45 million lines of code. So if we print it out, we get about uh, 800,000 pages of uh, uh, text. So uh, it, you can imagine that uh, if uh, we consider all these different systems that we use in our uh, cyberspace, if we want to or we have to inspect all that, we can most certainly cannot do that. So where is the security then? The security lies uh, on the uh, trust on the technology providers. So we have to trust them. And recently we have seen that there are some technology providers that we can trust and there are some that we cannot trust. At the moment, the biggest question is in the 5G communication technology field. But uh, very soon we will see that countries will differentiate the accepted uh, technology providers from the not accepted technology providers in other ICT fields as well. The second big uh, challenge that we have is related to the cloud uh, services. It's a question uh, about how we can trust cloud services and cloud service providers. So let me, let, let's think uh, quickly that what is actually a cloud service? To put it simple, cloud service means that we keep our data in somebody else's computer. The data is not in our uh, computer or in our information system, not in our cyber organism. It is somewhere else. So it means that we don't have total control over the data and services we have. Somebody else has to take care of cybersecurity for us. And in this case, we have to realize uh, certain risks related to these cloud services. First, the jurisdiction question, where the data is kept. If it's in our cyberspace, it's more or less we can manage the cyber risk. But if the data is located in, in another country, in another jurisdiction, 
It means that uh, our legal system doesn't apply there. We have to play according to somebody else's rules. The second is uh, internet connectivity. All these services are provided over the internet. But of, what if the internet connectivity fails? Uh, if it happens in our country, of course we can fix that because the internet in our territory, we have some control over it. But if the connectivity problem happens in another country, in another jurisdiction, then we really rely on the activities that others should take. And the third question is about the trust, trust of the cloud service provider. Uh, can we trust the service provider? Are we confident that uh, the service provider pays enough attention to cybersecurity? Uh, can we be confident that uh, the service provider uh, doesn't violate data protection and cybersecurity uh, rules and regulations? And uh, of course, we have to be smart as well that what we write into the contract, because the service is provided according to the contract and cybersecurity is provided according to the contract as well. So these are the big questions. And from the national security point of view, if we have, for example, one, two, three cloud service providers, it's not a very big issue. But we see the trend that in the near future, most of the services are provided through the cloud service. And this is a very big shift in the cybersecurity area, how we can ensure the protection of our data and the service as well. And the third big challenge is related to uh, ICT development, it is nothing new in, uh, in the cyber community. Everybody knows about this issue for many years. So the problem is that how to keep up with rapid digital development. And uh, I don't know how it is in your countries, but in Estonia, we see that the IT developers, they have the continuous urge to innovate. They want to do new things and they want to do it very rapidly. So it puts a lot of pressure to the cybersecurity guys that how to keep up with this rapid development. Um, and uh, it concerns all these different new technologies we have uh, already in place, like artificial intelligence, augmented reality, uh, Internet of Things, and also robotics that we see more and more on the streets these days. Uh, so I don't have the easy answer there. In the ideal world, uh, we probably have enough resources to deal with all that. But in real life, of course, we always lack of resources. So we have to be smart how to organize cybersecurity. And again, Estonia being is a small society, we have very many smart solutions how to, how to do that. So please contact our... E-Estonia showroom, they, they can direct you to the right companies who have these solutions. But our solution at the national level is um, we have uh, uh, some new ideas there as well. Uh, first of all, in coming months, we are going to uh, present our new cybersecurity strategy. And this time, we are going to do it a little bit differently. Uh, we are not going to have a totally separate strategy, but it's going to be part of our Estonia digital development plan. So the digital development plan has three sections. One is connectivity strategy, the second is IT strategy, and the third one is cybersecurity strategy. And what is new now is that we want to interlink all these different uh, strategies more together. Uh, and from the cybersecurity point of view, <clears throat> the main goal is to support the digital development. That's why we have three focus areas in the cybersecurity strategy. First, we have to modernize our cybersecurity management system in order to meet these new demands. The second, we have to uh, increase our analytical capacity. So it means that uh, we should have to deal more and more with artificial intelligence, IoT, robotics, etc., etc. And third, we have to increase also the existing cybersecurity capabilities. 
we already know what to do. We simply have to put more money uh, to, the, to this field. So that was very shortly an overview what we think, how we think about cybersecurity, what are the challenges in our eyes, and what are the future plans. So thank you very much from my side, and I'm happy to answer to your questions. Well, uh, Raul, thank you so much for, for being mm. here with us uh, on stage. Before We've got several questions for you, okay, actually. Great. Before we do that, however, <coughs> we want to look at the results of the very first poll. Uh, and if you remember um, the previous poll, um, of, of uh, the, the first poll, the results, um, you will remember that the question was, would you trust your government with your digital data? And can we see the results on the screen, please? <laughs> yes, no and way. here's a very interesting overview. Um, <coughs> so some people said, no way, yeah. absolutely not. Um, the majority said, yes, the government has proven to be trustworthy. Um, a quite sizable minority also said, for basic data, sure. But very importantly, not a single person said they can have whatever they want, just mm. like uh, Facebook and Google. What mm. are your thoughts on that? Uh, it is very interesting. It uh, probably shows the uh, general trust on the government. So. Uh, Estonia is, of course, a small society, and uh, I don't know, wh wh where's the other place we can put the trust, actually? Yeah. Because the, the, the different companies, they have, <coughs> of course, the business interest, that is natural. Mm. But uh, if you don't put the trust on the government, then I would say that there is need to change the government then. I think it's interesting because we see that there is some sort of basic level of trust there, mm -hmm. obviously, mm -hmm. which is an encouraging start. Mm -hmm. uh, but at the same time, um, we seem to trust the government less with our personal data than Google Maps, uh, because by with Google Maps we get <coughs> a concrete result, mm -hmm. a concrete use case, whereas most governments haven't really proven yet um, how they use that data for the citizens' mm. good. So I think that's going to be, um, in Estonia, 99% of government services are online, mm. but in many other countries, not so much yet. Th that's very interesting, actually. I don't know why people trust more the private companies, because yeah. private companies, the, the management is not transparent, but the government should have this transparency. But Absolutely. of course, I represent the government, so I might have <laughs> So you would view. say that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I cannot um, say otherwise. <laughs> uh, we've got several questions mm. for you. Um, I'm not sure exactly uh, whether we can get through all of them, but there's uh, one from the audience. There's actually two questions. Mm. Number one, what is the Estonian perception of the new EU cybersecurity strategy and NIS directive revision? Can you tell uh, us a bit more about yes, that? Yes, uh, I, I found, of course, I don't want to sound very bureaucratic because when we start to talk about the uh, European strategies and uh, NIS directives, fast. you know, <laughs> there are so many different details. But uh, what I would say that I think... Uh, these documents go to the right direction. So all the important uh, topics are covered, and also the NIST directive with, uh, uh, will have much more impact than before. So we basically, with the new uh, network and information uh, systems directive we or security directive, we will actually raise the minimum level of cybersecurity throughout the EU. So mm. I think it's a good thing. Uh, the second question that was a sort of follow-up from there, uh, how can uh, global and local industries best cooperate with governments to improve cyber information sharing and crisis management? Uh, that's a difficult question. Of course, uh, regarding crisis management, private sector, I it is good if private sector provides good tools mm. for this, uh, this activity <coughs> or this field. But uh, information sharing is tricky. It not always, or also in the government, it happens on uh, need-to-know basis. It's not like we share all information throughout the government all the time, yeah. specifically when it comes to the question of national security. So. I would say that case by case basis, and there has to be, of course, trust on the private sector side as well, so we know that they are not violate, uh, you know, the rules. Then, um, the last question that we sadly have time for is: How is Estonia planning on enhancing judicial coherence internationally? That we're all on the same page in terms to, of to enhance what? Uh, sorry, sorry. judicial coherence. So oh, that okay. in terms of privacy laws and so on, we're uh, all on the same page. Yeah, exactly. So we, we, what we can do is through the EU processes. The GDPR was the General Data Protection mm. Regulation is one of these kind of tools how we, we get this coherence. And now the NIST Directive 
Uh, yeah. The second version, it will be uh, the same way. So through this international, mostly through the EU cooperation, we will have that. And we already see that even countries that are very loosely associated with the EU, mm -hmm. such as Argentina, are implementing their own versions of the GDPR because they are dealing so much with European markets. Uh, so if we establish that common mm -hmm. ground in, in Europe, I think that's, exactly. a, that's a good start. And GDPR is not only for EU, but everybody who Absolutely. has EU citizen status. So it's extra extraterritorial regulation. It affects the development uh, throughout the world. Very much so. Mm -hmm. uh, Raul, thank you so mm -hmm. much for being with us on stage. Mm -hmm. Now, before we go to the next presentation, uh, I want to tell you about the second polling question as well. The question is, would you vote online if you could in your country? Uh, three options. Uh, number one, I'm already doing it. Um, there are not many, well, not many countries that offer that right now. Uh, number two, yes, it would be much simpler than going to the polling station. And number three, uh, no, I don't trust it, my vote could get lost. So uh, please answer over the next few minutes, but please don't focus too much on the poll because we also have uh, the very first company presentation. We've got three company presentations in total, and after that we head for, in my opinion, the most exciting part, even though the presentations are very good, uh, namely the breakout rooms where you can ask even more detailed questions and look at the demos and so on. Um, but without any further ado, let's go to our first company presentation. Uh, the representative is Lisa Pust. Uh, she's the head of cybersecurity business development at the company Cybernetica, and she will tell us how to best survive in a global pandemic with digital solutions. Let's take a look. Running a service always means dealing with someone else's data. It's like looking into windows of an apartment building. What you see could be mundane, sensitive, strictly confidential, or, depending on the industry, downright embarrassing. While building your business, you should focus on data privacy early on, so you wouldn't discover that the construction you've established has too many openings to count at the most inconvenient moment. What you need are Privacy Enhancing Technologies, or PETs for short, tools for preventing leaks and balancing data privacy with usability. Some of the PETs prevent identifying the data owners from the collected data. Others avert data breaches by cryptographic protection, even during processing. Finally, there are technologies to remotely audit the service and check that it processes data only for the allowed purpose. This reduces the chance of data leaks. Even if you have all the data and know everything you can learn from it, it's still hard to build the service to be private by design. We can help you launch new privacy honoring services easily. As specialists with more than 20 years of experience in developing security and privacy technologies, we make sure you'll meet privacy requirements and stand out among the competition by safeguarding the data your users put in your hands. Contact us on cyber.ee slash privacy. to answer that question, there's an unplanned reminder from Estonia, apparently the most digitally advanced nation in the world. 46% of those casting their vote in last elections in Estonia did that online using either one of these guys or one of these guys to do so, which also makes the 2020 US presidential elections look like a joke, frankly. It's from where I'm standing, looking at people by the thousands, lining up for hours, wearing masks during a global pandemic to exercise their democratic rights is beyond funny, frankly. So I'll be looking at the lessons from the modern world in how to securely accelerate digital transformation and therefore survive the global pandemic. And what a day it is to be looking at that. These pictures of just two weeks ago in the US Capitol meant that the presidential inauguration, um, 
apparently has eaten my pictures in the slides. Oh well, the good news is my slides are quite visuals heavy. But it meant the national celebration of rule of law based rituals, the presidential inauguration, happened with almost no people in attendance, but instead 25,000 National Guardsmen in there. And that's, of course, not just because of the pandemic, but because of the lesson Estonia learned already in 2007. And as our uh, uh, pr uh, previous president, Thomas Henrik Ilves, says, every time the world discovers how interconnected politics and our uh, digital way of life and therefore democracy and needing to secure our digital way, way of life is, the Baltics simply laugh. Because 2007 was eerily similar to things that have happened in the United States since 2016, in that we've been reminded that to enjoy the digital way of life, that way of life also needs to be secured. And cybersecurity is the necessary cost of a modern world. And it's all very much integrated with politics. Uh, of course, the modern world adds further complexity in a world where everything is connected. There's expected to be probably five times as many connected devices in the world as there are people. Think of that, five times as many. And that digital ecosystem needs to be secured very much in the way previous speakers have already highlighted. And so to throw a further ch challenge into the mix of complexity, 2020, of course, a year ago, gave us the curveball of a global pandemic when our uh, offices stopped looking like offices, wearing proper clothes became a rare treat. And that's what our working clothes looked like, a pair of slippers. The previous speakers have already, already highlighted how it wasn't as tough for Estonia as it was for many others, because to facilitate that accelerated digital transition, some places it got accelerated by more than a decade, we have in place a data exchange layer, X-Road, which is basically the UXP product my colleagues provide, as well as reasonable connectivity, a secure digital identity embedded in the chip and pin of my ID card or the crypto SIM card of my phone. But it also taught us lessons that I think go well beyond Estonia. In first of all, what we cannot change, what is the uncertainty that we have to accept in the modern world. First of all, it is that cyber attacks will always take place, as Thomas Reed very succinctly titled his book, if you've not read it, by the way, go and do that right away. And you have to accept that the only system that's secure is a system that's unplugged at the bottom of the ocean and buried under a concrete. But the availability of such a system leaves a little to be desired, let alone usability of it. And we've also learned that cybersecurity is fundamentally integrated with geopolitics and the most detrimental of cyber attacks are those that are sponsored or at least inspired by nation state actors. No, Petya not Petya and WannaCry, those most costly globally thus far, most would argue, have been, have been attributed to the Russian Federation and North Korea. Um, which also means that regardless of where we are, we know that spies are going to spy. Meaning that in a global pandemic, it might have moved spycraft into a new domain, but those powerful advanced persistent threat actors who can do most damage, as also demonstrated by the solar winds Orion breach that affected 
many government agencies across the world, inc including those in charge of security, both in the US and, and several European countries, are, were taking advantage of the pandemic and, and the, so were the reactive opportunistic attackers. Um, and we know that vulnerabilities are inevitable, particularly Again, as highlighted by the Solar Winds Orion, where a software comes together from components, it also means that down the supply line, as Raulrik highlighted, there will be vulnerabilities. Which brings us to what we can change. And first and foremost, that is to build a resilient ecosystem of facilitators that allow you to live a secure life. And in Estonia, to build that digital habit, that means a secure digital identity, whether it's, again, a chip and pin solution, whether it's a SIM, and uh, whether it's a SIM and pin solution, or whether it's the seamless solution that, my colleagues at Cybernetica have been, builded, have been building called SplitKey, which is based on the idea that eventually our phones might be uh, seamless and therefore we need to be doing mobile identity without reliance on a SIM card. So that's SplitKey for you. You have to be able to take sector-specific measures, and that is particularly true in medicine, as that is a fundamentally vulnerable sector. And as you're building a security culture, that has to be all-encompassing. Nothing is a better example than the Estonian Hoya app, the contact tracing app, developed based to a great degree on cybernetic's privacy-preserving preser technologies, which showed that to contract, contact track, uh, trace, regardless of what you think, of content tracing as a public health measure. You can do it in a truly privacy-preserving way where there's no centralized data con uh, collection, there's no centralized processing, there's no personalization of the data, and no information exchange with a central body until a positive diagnosis needs to be confirmed. And the government does not know who's been notified. Truly privacy preserving, no GPS, no such, how, what do we call it in this business? Government surveillance bullshit. You can truly be privacy preserving and that needs to be the central asset of your privacy culture. And approach to, private, uh, to remote work therefore needs to be beyond Perimeter defense, which is how we're used to thinking of defending our networks. It no longer works. Which brings us to what everyone can do. First and foremost, accept that there is uncertainty. And think of not avoiding risks, but to off your level of risk tolerance. Secondly, operational security. How do you make sure that those remote workers are secure, and particularly they're secure where perimeter defense has shifted back to endpoint defense. You need to be able to identify both your machines and your people, which brings us to keeping your house in order. To keep your house in order, you must be building situational awareness. Situational awareness on top of digital identity and secure data exchange is knowing what's going on in your networks, knowing what are the assets, what is the traffic, and so on. And that is what I truly believe in to the extent that I'm building out, out myself the cybersecurity product portfolio at Cybernetica, with which I'll invite you to join us in the breakout session later on today, where we'll be talking about the products of Cybernetica, the probably most research and innovation intense company in Estonia and most likely the Baltic region. Well, uh, Lisa, thank you so much uh, for, for being with us. Uh, we've got several questions for you as well, sure. of course. Uh, but before we do that, we have to deal with the result of the previous poll. Uh, the
question was, would you vote online if you could in your country? There were three answers. I'm already doing it. Yes, it would be simpler than going to the polling station, as you suggested as well. Uh, or, uh, no, I don't trust it. My vote can get lost. Uh, and we see that we've got apparently quite a few viewers from Estonia as well who are already doing it. Um, 20 people say, yes, it would be much simpler than going to the polling station. And only three people say, no, I don't trust it. My vote can get lost. Very interesting. Your thoughts on this? I mean, if you say if you don't trust it, you're saying there isn't enough of maturity in your digital services ecosystem that you trust that. It's a terrifically bad idea to start digitalization from voting simply because of the very special and sacred nature of elections in a democracy. And of course, I'd like to point out that if you don't run a democracy, this whole question becomes irrelevant. So, but in a democracy, because of how sacred elections are, the digitalization of them needs to rely on the ecosystem and your election should not be any more digital than the governance they support. It certainly shouldn't be the first service that you offer online for the oh, population. Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, but also, on the other hand, I would say, uh, if, you do, if you think that your vote might get lost, don't try postal voting. Um, so um, we've got several questions from the audience. Uh, the first one is, uh, what experience does Cybernetica have in working with governments? So we worked with dozens of governments around the world. We do have, being a company that goes back all the way to the 1960s and quite fundamental research, and still having about one in five of my colleagues holding PhDs, uh, we've been working with the very fundamentals of how the Estonian ecosystem comes together. But then we've done either the fundamental facilitators, so whether it's identity on, or whether it's the secure data exchange layer mm -hmm. in dozens of governments and ecosystems around the world, or we've worked with specific areas, be it customs, uh, be it in the defense, other areas, mm -hmm. building particular uh, products. But what I've learned about my colleagues is that they're fundamentally incapable of building something that's insecure. That's a very good promise uh, to, to make to future customers as well, I would say. We can't do it. <laughs> um, how do you approach the elderly that don't know how to use the internet and technologies and their tendency not to trust them? I think that's a <coughs> cultural problem and not an age problem. Yes. Uh, what we see, and, and, and voting is a great example because it's quite, the voting behavior of age groups is quite well known using the different methods of mm -hmm. voting. And what we know is that young people, despite of how you can vote, don't vote. They simply, and you need, simply by making voting available online in this hip modern digital sphere, does not make youth uh, participation any higher. Mm. And, and similarly, you know, the services and systems you build, A, have to rely on that secure ecosystem. You can't expect to train any citizen, any user to use a service, whether it's tax filing, whether it's registering their children for school, that they don't do that often. You can't expect them to learn a habit for that, but you build habit through the ecosystem as, a, as such. You know, by having a secure digital identity that allows you to bank, mm. that allows you to see how your child is progressing in school, that allows you to see your medical history, uh, allows doctors to, to write prescriptions without physically needing to sign it, because of course doctors' mm. handwritings are so clear anyway. Notoriously, so, yeah. So you do that by building habit mm. and making it as easy as it would be otherwise. I, th I think the user friendliness aspect is also very important. If you simply digitalize a, a paper document and you don't make it any more user friendly, people won't use it because there's no incentive to use it. Exactly. Uh, Digitalizing stupid just gives you digital stupid. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. Um, final question. Uh, I think I know your answer on this, uh, and I agree, um, but <laughs> uh, still we, we have to ask this. Where do you start with cybersecurity in your opinion? Uh, my distinct belief is that to start with the facilitators, there are particular use cases, let's say in disaster recovery after natural disasters, 
or with very dispersed populations. Mm. When you start with particular services that are situation specific to those settings, but during peace and prosperity, you know, during some stability at least, you start with building the fundamental facilitators that you then can, anyone can develop services mm. onto. And as I think has been the thread running through the presentation so far, those are identity, a data exchange platform, a data exchange layer that's secure, and, and thirdly, a shared approach to security that is very deeply, in my opinion, embedded, not in declarations, but in situational awareness, in understanding what actually is going on. Because if you don't monitor for incidents, mm. you have zero incidents. Yeah. But a whole lot of damage. Sounds like a safe system to me. No. Um, <laughs> no. no. <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> uh, well, Lisa, thank you so much for, for being with us. And of course, I also encourage you to join uh, her and Cybernetica uh, in the breakout room later on. Uh, before we head on to our next presentation, we have the third poll question for you. The question is, which sector would benefit most strongly from identity authentication? methods. Would it be government, banking, mobility or shopping in your opinion? And while you uh, think about that, I would like to introduce to you our next speaker. Uh, it is Janar Gorohov, uh, who is the Chief Product Officer at Verif, and he will tell us about fraud in the online world. Let's take a look. This is Tom. In everyday life, you won't even see him. But we know he's there. Tom is here to do what he does best. <coughs> he learns about you, even if you're just trying to relax. And he knows exactly how to take notes. Guys like Tom make every day challenging. But not on our watch. With Verif, Tom doesn't stand a chance. Hi everyone, I'm Janar. It's great to be part of the Estonia Digital Discussion. And I'm here to tell you about uh, fraudsters like Creepy Tom, as you just saw in the video. Um, so, let's get into it. There are more than 200 million businesses worldwide, but still about 5% of the digital economy happens online. The biggest barrier for entry for those businesses is limited trust. And limited trust slows down the digitalization of those businesses. Um, if we're looking forward into the problem, then identity theft and fraud has been marked in the top five risks globally in 2019 report. And businesses worldwide lose about $200 billion due to the identity theft. The problem has been fixed by charging honest people and businesses take 5% tax uh, that needs to be paid because of fraud. We at Verif witness online fraud attempts every day. And in order to help our customers and partners to understand and share the transparency, we put together a very fraud report about 2020. We looked back into the previous year, 12 months, and uh, shared what are the different te techniques and tricks that fraudsters use in order to trick the system. We looked at the three major industries that uh, we are working together with, which is fintech, mobility, and crypto, and definitely 
uh, we took a look how COVID-19 pandemic has induced the fraud globally. If we're looking at the whole identity verification market and how has it changed, then pandemic has changed it a lot. Identity verification market has um, increased twice during the year, mainly driving by businesses that needed to adapt to the digitalization that went around. And due to that, we saw that many new industries actually uh, needed identity verification, needed to verify people. Among them, for example, governments, health, and even education, if uh, you want to take an exam and verify who's the person behind the screen. One of the growing phenomena in online identity verification is the rise of the deep fakes. What is a deep fake? It's synthesized media where the likeness of the person in the image or video has been replaced by somebody else. And this is one of the examples that I wanted to show you as well, is that um, fraudsters are getting smarter and technology advances, which means that it's becoming harder and harder for just the human eye to make the difference between what's real and what is fake. If we're looking into the, into the examples, what is the fraud that we actually see, then something to keep in mind is if we're looking at the three industries, which is uh, crypto, fintech, and mobility, the average fraud rate is approximately 5%. This means that 5% of all the verifications that we see are fraudulent. So let's look into the fintech and the reasons why the fraud trend actually changed during the year. So beginning of the year, as people started to move their banking online due to the pandemic, then the fraud more than tripled. But on the other hand, if we're looking to a different sector, which is the mobility, then um, at the end of the summer, when uh, people um, try to find a different means for transportation in order to be healthy and avoid risks, then they actually uh, started to use more scooters, uh, rental cars, and mopeds. So, uh, but uh, if we're looking at very f with, uh, what are the different fraud types that we're seeing, then identity fraud is one of those types, and the most common type. Uh, what is identity fraud? If I'm taking someone else's uh, government-issued ID and trying uh, to pretend to be somebody else. So if we're looking at it in crypto and in mobility, then we're seeing, comparing the first and second half of the year, in crypto, 11% of increase in that type of fraud, and in mobility, 16%. But let's go into a real practical example, what we at Verif are seeing as one of the examples that we catch. So we noticed abnormally busy traffic in one of the car retail shops. And additionally to the store employees who were being verified, uh, we saw that the customers uh, of that shop were asked to present their government issued ID and do a portrait photo. Something that we acknowledged and understood is that uh, the customers didn't actually uh, have a clue why they were doing this. So in the background, there was an account opened for them without their understanding. And we, because of that, we let our customer know what is going on. And we put an end to this fraud vector, which meant that the fraudsters couldn't actually get free money from those accounts. If we're looking from this car retail shop from the US and going to a global view, where are we seeing actually the most fraud? Then US is leading in global, which means that we're seeing 10% of all the verifications that are coming in are fraudulent. But if we're looking at it from the mobility or fintech standpoint, then we're seeing that in mobility, it's the Netherlands, which is leading, and in fintech, it's Romania. Verif is building infrastructure for trust. We allow any website and mobile application to match the person with the government-issued ID. Identity verification isn't just about comparing two pictures. It's analyzing multiple data inputs. So for us, it's looking at the behavioral information, it's analyzing the documents, device information, network information, biometrics, and multiple other parameters to understand that Janar is Janar in the online world. 
And we rely mainly on AI and automation, so we call on human intuition only when it's absolutely necessary uh, to understand if the verification is fraudulent or not. So it needs an intelligent fraud engine to beat fraud. And while doing that, we actually uh, support different documents from more than 190 different countries and more than 9,000 different documents. To summarize uh, this together, I'd like to remind everyone that more businesses are mov moving online and more people are moving online as well. This means that fraudsters are moving online. Due to that, Verif needs to be a couple of, head, couple of steps ahead of fraudsters in order to protect the businesses and the people. Thank you. I'm ready to take the questions now. If you'd like to know what are the different document types that are being used by fraudsters, then join me into the breakout room and we can discuss it even further. Uh, well, Jana, th uh, thank you so much for being with us in the studio and thanks for uh, giving us an overview over the uh, Fraud Report uh, 2020. Uh, we do have a couple of questions from the audience as well. Uh, but first of all, we want to take a look at uh, the results of the previous poll. Uh, which sector would benefit, uh, benefit the most from uh, secure uh, identity authentication methods? And the answers are as follows. Uh, it is a quite clear majority for government, uh, followed closely by banking, uh, with mobility and shopping being a tiny bit further behind. Uh, would you agree with that, or uh, where do you see the most use cases for, for digital identity? I think uh, digital identity is really sector agnostic, so it can be actually all of them, and that's what we're seeing as well at Verif, that uh, it doesn't matter <coughs> if it's mobility, banking, government, um, the identity is core for everything because in order to trust, you need to verify. Absolutely. Uh, in Estonia, we have an electronic identity that is not just used uh, by, by my doctor and by the tax authority, but also by uh, my favorite bookstore and my supermarket. So this is uh, absolutely very important, this agnostic approach. Uh, we do have several questions, as I said. Uh, the first one is, what is the guaranteed service level of ID verification that Verif can offer? Uh, automated versus manual, uh, in brackets, double verification. So if I understood it correctly, like uh, what is the percentage that we're doing it automatically versus what we're doing it manually? Uh, so for us, it's 95% <coughs> of all the checks that we're doing are already automated. But the question is, what is those 5% that we need the human intuition to be called in? So that where, that's where the understanding the different types of fraud actually comes into play, that uh, Frosters are really, mm, let's, um, let's call it innovative, and um, that's why it's a continuous fight against fraud that we always need to keep innovating. It's not about building one blocker, but it's, uh, it's a layer after layer after layer, and that's why for the years to come, we need to analyze what are the different attempts that are coming in and always iterate based on this. Because for various cases as well, as we're working with different sectors, then we're seeing what are the different fraud types. So if we see that uh, fraud is coming in from one angle, we can actually uh, shield all of our partners uh, against that type of fraud. So it's uh, building up the moat of defense uh, mm. behind that. You mentioned different layers and filters. Can you give us a rough idea how many layers we're talking about? Well, that's definitely something <coughs> that uh, I can't share out loud, all the different layers. But uh, some of the examples that where we go into is, as I mentioned, using the device or the biometrics. Mm. So if I do verification on my own and even switch the device, switch the document, then we can link those verifications together just using the biometrics. And same for the mobile phone as well, that I can switch the person, switch the document, use the same mobile phone and still Verif would know about it. And this is kind of cross-linking and understanding how different verifications come together. Super helpful for the car retail shop as, as I brought out as well. Very good. Yeah, it's it's always nice to see real life cases where you where you can save people's lives, money, and and uh, lots of stress as well. Um, the second question is: How can we protect ourselves from deep fakes that pose as different people and commit fraud or try to commit fraud? I think yet again, it's uh, it's the layers. So in mm. our case, how we are managing to protect against deep fakes is uh, we have a video first approach. 
So each verification that we do actually comes in with a video recording. So if I think about it, then it's always how we look at it, the cost of fraud mm -hmm. aspect. How much does it cost for me as a fraudster to do the fraud versus what's the benefit that I'm getting out of it, actually? So our goal is to increase the cost of fraud so it doesn't make sense to do the fraud at all and thus blocking this. So uh, that's where the video first approach has been really, really useful for that. And this has helped us to protect against deep fakes as well as one of the examples. Um, abso absolutely. Um, so um, we are uh, heading over to the next presentation. Thank you so much for, for being with us. Uh, before we head to the next presentation, we want to talk about the next poll, of course. Um, the question to you, the audience, is how often do you change your passwords? And please be honest. Um, is it every week? Uh, is it closer to twice a year? Or is it only after my Gmail account gets hacked? Uh, fingers crossed that will never happen. So please share your thoughts on that as well. Um, in the meantime, we will start with the introduction for our next and final company presentation before we head on to the breakout rooms. Uh, his name is Lauri Alman. He is the co-founder of Science Cybexer Technologies, and he will tell you more about the uh, idea of the human firewall and what it all means. Let's take a look at that. Hello, my name is uh, Lauri Alman and uh, I'm one of the co-founders of Cybexer Technologies. My title is Chief Storytelling Officer and my job is to predict scenarios, what may happen. And let me tell you, these last two years it has been one hell of a difficult job. If two years ago I would have submitted a scenario to a client of the stuff that is happening now. They would have rejected it, saying it's overblown, unrealistic, full of cliches, and simply impossible. The hard truth is that it is happening now. There's um, a really hard heavy stuff uh, going on in the cyber world. The threats have grown exponentially. Some of the threats have realized that uh, we uh, uh, didn't think would be possible. So I think the first message uh, from our company, it is, it is here, it is happening, it is happening now. Let me take you through a uh, 30, to, uh, 30 second to one minute simple scenario that we uh, have created and let's see what we can do about it. Um, a typical uh, scenario would start with a critical information infrastructure provider who now has a new e-service. They need to reach to more customers, so they hire a well-known programming company to provide that service. The well-known programming company goes to another country, maybe not so well-known country, and hires another company, maybe not so well-known company, and finally ends up buying it. What happens here is this company now, not beknownst to this critical information sector company, is in the supply chain. Somebody clicks on a bad link, something gets executed, and bad stuff happens. Bad stuff happens, 
and this is now on the table of CEO who probably has no training on cybersecurity, uh, there is implication on the stock price and whatnot. The attackers do something really banal, like a uh, um, defacement or distributed denial of service attack, putting a company under hard pressure. And what we have, we have exhausted workforce uh, that we have uh, not enough, and we have a blackout. This is what we have to deal with. And the question why this is happening is all related to human beings. And the cliche answer to this tends to be because human are, humans are the weakest link. Our job in the company, as we have defined it, is to counter that uh, somewhat truism and to say that actually humans are the most important link and we need to look at those instances and ask why these things are happening and what can we do to turn this weak link into the strong link and build a human firewall. Let's see, um, somebody clicks on a link. And this is a, this is a matter of cyber hygiene, cyber awareness. And our approach to cyber awareness is really to drill down on the question of why and ask why people are engaged the behavior that they are engaged. This is not a shooting com competition. This is not a Ten Commandments moralizing les lesson, but it's an exercise in patience. Estonian government has implemented a government-wide cyber awareness program. We are uh, proud to be part of it, and, and this is uh, one of the challenges. A CEO uh, having to answer the question, the cliche question is, it is a technical problem and what we uh, need to deal here is that no, no, it is not. It is to make everybody understand that behind the table deciding those issues are, in, are people who, are, who have no uh, cyber background and maybe they are in roles of taking some of the most important decisions. So. It is a non-technical issue, and we need to find a way how to create clarity of mind among those leaders. Now, something technical happens. And in technical level, we also counter cliches. And the typical cliche as a technical cybersecurity company providing mostly technical training, cyber ranges, one of the statements that we have countered very often is, it's unique. We are too big. We are too special. We are too confidential. Our industry is uh, extremely different. So let's take this uh, notion and deal with it. And to deal with this um, uh, problem, we actually created an exercise which is called cooperative resilience. We tested out what, if, what happens if we set up a cyber range with a scenario with what I just described and invite various critical information providers exercise together. Can we get from this, it is unique, to cooperative resilience, and we did. Banking, energy, uh, water, uh, beer manufacturing, uh, we're all exercising on the same range, sharing intelligence, sharing their experiences, and building this resilience. And if you're interested in the breakout session, I'm going to talk about this exercise. We can walk through the virtual machines that we use. We can actually go to the range, and I can show you what we did. But what we also thought was, would it be possible to actually build something permanent of that exercise? Can we build a global cyber range federation uh, that, uh, that would serve those customers on a more permanent basis. And again, what we countered in, in, in this uh, challenge was everybody saying it is unique. So um, one of the conclusions that we had in, in, in the cyber range business was that actually let's try to challenge this. And in order to build a firewall in this technical area, what we really need to do is to break the wall and increase the break of wall non-transparency and to increase transparency, not only among customers, but also among manufacturers. What we are going to produce uh, and publish in www.cybexer.com website is a open, cyber range configurator, and yes, together with prices. 
that uh, everybody can go, everybody can see how special they are and, and what uh, solutions for this we can uh, uh, offer and if that can be standardized. But that was not the only picture. Uh, that was not all the pictures that I showed. I had the fourth element in our uh, presentation, and that was the element of blackout. This is probably one of the greatest problems that we are, we are facing now uh, in, the human, uh, in the human field. This is the cliche uh, answer to this is there are not enough qualified personnel uh, to deal with our cyber threats. We are really living in a time and age when this generation of young people could actually face a global blackout caused by a cyber attack. This is what who we call a blackout generation. And to face that challenge, what we have decided is to actually use that very generation to be part of the solution. We have created a project called Cyber Stars, and our goal is to attract in the company around the world young people from 16 to 18, 19, 20 years old to the profession of cybersecurity. Our problem, we are also more than glad to uh, engage people who have experience in. Uh, in cyber and who already have displayed interest. But most interested we are in young people who have not shown any particular interest. 50% of our cyber stars who take part in cyber battle series that we organize in a format that is similar to American Idol or UK Got Talent um, in a scenario-based fun way are young people who have not shown any interest in cyber, who we attract through social media and, uh, and advertising. And uh, it has proven uh, quite successful, and this is something with which we want to reach out also across uh, the world. And this is another topic that I would like to discuss. Uh, in our breakout sessions, and this is how we build the cyber. Uh, this is how we build the human firewall in cybersecurity. We take patience to ask why people click those wrong links. We cre create clarity of mind in our strategic leaders. We try to deal with the uniqueness of those organizations, and we take the next generation to solve the problem that is ahead of them. This is all. Join me in the breakout session, and we are going to talk about the exercise, cooperative resilience, range configurator, and also cyber battle series. Well, uh, Lauri, thank you so much for uh, telling us more about what CyberExec Technology uh, does. Um, we've got two questions from the audience, but first we will take a look at the results of the previous poll. The question was, how often do you change your passwords? One person said every week. Um, I would love that person to reach out to us uh, at the Estonia Briefing Center and uh, so we can send you a tiny chocolate basket. Uh, to the other people, well, it's basically 50-50 between twice a year and only after my Gmail account gets hacked. Does that sound fair to you? That sounds suspicious every week. Uh, I would like to uh, have a discussion in the breakout room <laughs> because in our platform, uh, uh, that would qualify as a risky answer because it's too correct. Yeah. <laughs> so sometimes we uh, sometimes we also are look uh, we are looking out for people who actually answer too correctly. How many uh, passwords do you have? I have same password for every account, of course. How many USB drives do you use? I never use USB drives. Where do you keep your password? In a locker room. Where do you keep the key to the locker? I keep it chained on my, uh, on my neck. Where is it when you take a shower? I take it with, with me to the shower. So yes. this, is, <laughs> this is suspicious. So I, I, I don't <coughs> believe that. Uh, I'd like to have a discussion. <laughs> Um, so I've got two questions uh, for you. The first one is um, not so much tied to everything that you've said, uh, but uh, still interested in, in you and what you do. A really cool job title. How do I get a job like that? Um, it's just um, you don't have to be a cyber expert. Uh, I think uh, uh, and uh, most important and I think interesting part uh, for me is when I tell the stories, I try to listen uh, more importantly, I think, uh, and, and, and try to build a bridge between technical and, uh, 
and uh, non-technical personnel. My first job to tell a cyber story was in 2007 when I was permanent secretary of defense. Estonia was just attacked and we had to decide if we're going to talk about this. And then we had to create various talking points. And the technical breach that I would like to describe was the moment I, I entered to the national cert, it's full of cyber experts, and I ask a question, can you tell me how many computers were belonging to the botnet that attacked Estonia in 2007. And the room full of technicians burst out in laughter because technically it doesn't make any sense mm. because every computer is different. <coughs> what you're interested, they asked me, is the compute power? I said, no, 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 no. I'm interested in how many computers. But they said, this is not interesting for me. I said, no, I'm creating talking points for the government uh, mm. to use. And what I want to know is how many people's computers were trespassed to mount this uh, account, uh, this, uh, this attack. And so we created a talking point. Estonia in 2007 was attacked by more than one million computer in 140 countries, including Vatican. So this is what we do. Yeah, so, so I think it's, it's sort of humanizing cybersecurity. Humanizing, we need to tell levels. the story and we need to put this thing into <coughs> human language, but also we need to keep listening to technical side. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, the um, more topical question was, uh, what is the most interesting hacking target that the company has ever had? Can you tell us more about that? River Danube. Mm -hmm. um, exercise 2018, Austrian uh, government, we did it, and it was widely published as well. Uh, it was open to, uh, uh, to various countries and, uh, and wider public, so we can a little bit talk about it. And uh, what we were asked there to do was to create a scenario whereby a river Danube was hacked. And in the, in the immediately I, I thought that, you know, it's a natural it's phenomenon, <laughs> it's water. <laughs> but turns out river Danube is an information system. Mm. It's, co it's controlled by levees and dams and, and all that kind of stuff. So uh, you can actually shut down a pretty big chunk of European economy if you hack river Danube. Don't do it, but uh, I'm just saying. Yeah, so yeah, it's, I think it also sort of uh, um, changes the focus on what can be uh, sort of touched by security and cyber, cyber attacks. So it's not just a server in a room, but also uh, a more ecosystem approach that, uh, that can affect uh, whether, whether it's telecommunications lines or electricity or uh, infrastructure channels. So, so everything from A to Z, really. Exactly. Yeah. Um, Lauri, thank you so much uh, for being with us. Thank you, Florian. Um, thank you also to the audience for all the lovely questions. Of course, we're not done yet at all, uh, because now we're heading over to the breakout rooms, so you can decide uh, which of the three companies you would like to join uh, to see their demos, to talk more about their uh, products and projects for the future, um, and exchange thoughts with them as well. But before we head there, uh, I would just like to express my gratitude for, for the questions uh, to the speakers, uh, to our um, coordinators uh, at Royal uh, Experience. Um, and just a reminder to you as well, of course, we will send you a link afterwards uh, with the recording so you can check it out later again and show it to your friends and colleagues uh, if you so wish. Um, also, the next digital discussion is already being planned. It will happen in March for sure, and it will be about electronic identity, one of the key factors and one of the foundational parts uh, for a properly functioning uh, digital society. Um, before we go, we will show you a small video about uh, the Estonia Briefing Center and the kinds of services that we offer uh, to um, people from around the world, whether you're a government representative or, or whether you want to digitalize uh, your country, uh, sorry, your company environment as well. Uh, from my side, it's been a pleasure uh, hosting you. Uh, I thank you very much for watching and I wish you a lot of fun with the different breakout rooms. So have a good time, stay safe and healthy, and we'll see you at the next digital discussion. Thanks and bye-bye.